Good to see you this morning. I'm glad you're here. And uh, I was thinking about uh, all those people on the screen. The reason I use that background for our intro is the fact that everything we do is a decision, isn't it? And every decision we make makes the direction of our life change. And that's what we've learned in the last two weeks. And we're on our final week of this series, Defining Moments. And, and, and I was thinking about the, the biggest issue of our life. And I don't know if you know what the biggest issue of your life is, but the biggest issue of our life is something that we, we send, tend to ignore. In fact, in 21st century America, we've made it a problem because in 21st century America, the culture of the world now is that you are a victim. And that's not your problem today. You're not a victim. You've been told you're a victim, but you're not a victim. And yet we identify with the victim mentality because we don't get our way, we don't get what we want, we don't get our, our choices the truth is, you are not a victim, you are a sinner by choice. And I know we just start off pretty rough on this sermon, but man, if we would just embrace the fact that we are sinners, it would make things a lot easier in life. See, we deny ourselves the issues of life because we do this, and, and just to give you a recap, once again, week one, we talked about in defining moments, we talked about the moment of decision, and we understood it's the little decisions of life that really make us, because we are the sum of all the choices in our lives. And that seems so monumental, because we've got people that are getting married in the next week, in the next uh, couple weeks, in the next couple months, and that, those seem to be the biggest issues in our lives. But we also have issues with the fact that we think that, hey, where I choose to go to college after graduation is the biggest moment of our life, and it's not. Marriage is not. The, the, the day you say I do, and, and there's going to be a ceremony this week here on Saturday at the church, that's not going to be the biggest day of their marriage. It's going to be a day, but it's every day the choices they make along the way, and we've said that. And that led us to week two where we said, you know, the defining moments of our lives are based upon the direction. So we talked about the moment of direction. Because here's the, here's the simple truth. The path you're on in your life leads to somewhere. And so often we wake up and go, this isn't where I thought it would go. But no, the road you travel leads to a destination. So you better look at the road you're on because it leads you somewhere in your life. And you may find yourself waking up where you didn't want to. Waking up in a marriage you didn't want. Waking up in a job you, you don't like. Waking up in situations that you can't handle. But the good news is today we're going to talk about something totally different. And I've started off, if you've been paying attention, I started off with a quote every week from someone who wasn't really a Christian. Um, and it, they're not even Christian uh, quotes, but today I want to start off with this quote. The, <clears throat> the truth is, the way to get started, and this is a good one, the way to get started is to quit talking and start doing and that was put out by the great theologian, Walt Disney. It was. Okay, now he's not really a theologian, but we know that. But he's right, isn't he? Yeah. And here's the deal. Today, this is, we're going to talk about the moments, the moment that makes a difference in our lives. And that moment is just what Walt Disney is saying here. The moment we stop talking about all the things we're going to do, talking about all the things we should do, talking about all the ways we could be, and we start doing something about it. It's the activity that matters, isn't it? See, the choice that doesn't drive us to an action is a waste of time. And that's the point. If you have your Bibles, we're in the book of 2 Timothy. And 2 Timothy, and, and you, out of all the, the, the subjects, when we talked about this act of defining moments, I was thinking about this. In the Bible, there are so many great stories, so many life-changing stories, so many, I would say, defining moments. Defining moments. I mean... Abraham sells everything, packs up, and goes. Genesis chapter 12, that's a defining moment, isn't it? 
And so he's the father of faith. Moses talks to a burning bush, and he does what God asked him to do and leads his people out of Egypt as God leads him, defining moment in Moses. David, as a young teenager, goes out and battles a nine-and-a-half-foot-tall giant, defining moment in his life, wasn't it? And we could go through all these things, but if you've been here for the series, this is what you know. We haven't talked about any of them. This is the first chance you're hearing about it. Why? In fact, it's sort of crazy that we're talking and we're going to take our defining moments from a guy who's on his last words in life. He's getting ready to have his head severed. And I think that's, that's what means so much more to me because Paul understood a defining moment in a life. And when Paul does this, he looks at this young, young man, Timothy, just as, as, as we should be looking at our own lives. And he says, hey, I want to help you with the defining moments of your life. I want to give you something to think about, and all of us in here, from the oldest to the youngest, we need to embrace this because today is the day we choose, and we need to quit talking and start doing. That's what Walt Disney's trying to teach us. So if you have your Bibles, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, and we've sort of gone through some of the other chapters that are behind this, but I want you to see the words that Paul uses here. He says this, and and pay very close attention to what he's saying. We're just going to read the first seven verses. He says, you then, personal, right? You then, my son. Now, Timothy was not his physical son. He He was using this as a term of endearment. He's saying, hey, I'm getting ready to die. I'm leaving you the heritage. I've trained you. I've mentored you. I've discipled you. So you're my son in the faith. So you then, my son, be strong. Be strong. I love that, right? Be strong. I don't want some wimpy guy. Hey, by the way, if you're one of those wimpy guys that shakes hands like a dead fish, don't do that to me. Ugh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's, that's not in my notes at all. But uh, uh, uh. shake a hand like a man. Now, you don't have to break my fingers either, okay? I don't need to know how strong you are. Just shake it with, with you know, I was always taught, look the guy in the eye, shake their hand like you mean it, okay? Don't give me the, uh, okay? We're, we're worried about you if you do that. That's nothing, that has nothing to do with the sermon. I don't know why I brought that up. Be strong, and be strong in a specific area of your life. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And that's tough because that's not an area I control, is it now? The grace of God to me is not something I control. It's something that was given freely to me, so I can't earn it. I can't manufacture it. I can't do any of those things. And that just leaves us that interesting thought. Verse number two, he says, and the things, keep going with this thought, once you're strong, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable, uh, and trust to reliable um, uh, uh, people who will be, also be qualified to teach others. Um, and that's so important because that's the multiplication factor. Verse number three, he says, join in me, uh, join with me in suffering. Hey, that's a party, isn't it? Join with me. We're going to have a suffering party today. No, listen to what he's going to say. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And he keeps going. He says in verse number four, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer and know who your commanding officer is. Verse five, he goes on and says, similarly, here's another example. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. And then verse 6, he says, the hardworking farmer, here's our third area, the hardworking farmer should be first to receive uh, a share of the crops. Why? Because, in verse number 7, he goes on to say, uh, you should reflect on these things. And there's an idea behind this of we're building on this concept. So all three of those things go together. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And in this short passage here, in this short passage in in the first uh, seven verses of of 2 Timothy, Paul gives some insight here. But you have to understand what's going on here. These are the words of a dying man. Think about that in your life. If these were the last things you wanted to tell somebody, these probably wouldn't be the words you'd probably use, would they? But there's an issue behind everything. You see, As we go through this, what we have to realize, and we said this last week, the road you're on takes you to a destination, and it may seem obvious, but here's what I want you to understand. To go somewhere else, other than the direction you're going, you have to leave where you are. (laughs) You know, the journey of a thousand steps starts with the first one, right? You've heard that before. And that's the idea here. And, And to go somewhere else, you may have to leave what is known to you. 
And that makes us very uncomfortable, doesn't it? You may have to leave what is comfortable. You may have to leave what is predictable. You may have to leave what is easy to step forward into your destiny as a Christ follower is what Paul's talking about here. And, and, and you might have to step away. And what he wants Timothy to understand is in order to step into your destiny, sometimes you have to step away from your security. And that is so, so foreign to us as Americans. Because everything we do is about our own pleasure. And I know that's a tough one there. But it's true. And, and if we understand something, see here, I want to go back to understanding who Paul is talking to, this young man, Timothy. Timothy is not the her- hero of our story. We'd like him to be. We hope he could be one day, but he's not. See, the guy who's the Superman in, in disguise in Christian clothing is this guy, Paul, right? Paul is Mr. Super Christian, and, and he's the guy we all wish we could be like. I mean, here's, here's a guy that he gets stoned and gets up and walks away from it. Everybody else thought he was dead, but he gets up and walks away from it. Here's a guy that's shipwrecked, and it doesn't deter him from planting churches and witnessing to people. There's no fear on this planet that drove Paul into anything other than serving God. And that's what's amazing about Paul as we sit here and and think about his story. Uh, But with Timothy, Timothy's got another problem. See, it all goes back to John. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said this, and I, I said this this morning in our Sunday school class. Jesus said, in this world, we're all in this world, in this world, you'll have trouble. (laughs) He didn't say you might have trouble. He didn't say you could have trouble. He said, you will have trouble. Hey, if you you haven't experienced trouble this last week, you're not not alive. That's all I get to say. There's something wrong. Because you are going to have, it's a promise of God. And why is it so disheartening when we have problems? Because we don't listen to the rest of it. Because Jesus said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. (laughs) <laughs> we sort of forget. We dwell on the problems we have, don't we? Nobody knows the problems I've seen, right? That's how we are. And we play the victim card. Remember that card? We play the victim card. Oh, poor us. Poor us. We got, didn't we get deceived in the garden? No, we chose. Eve got deceived. Adam chose. And we were Adam in the story. We're all sinners, not victims. So stop playing the victim card here. Stop looking at your life going, man, it's so hard. I do this all the time myself. I'm speaking to me first. But we've got to stop playing that victim card. And you know what? The problem with Timothy is he played a victim in life. He became a Christian, and his dad wasn't a good Christ follower to what we know. His dad was unsaved. His mom and his grandma took him to church, took him to Sunday school. No, not really, because they didn't have any of those things. But they educated him in the faith factor. And so his faith is transferred down the road, not because his parent, his grandma and his mom were saved, but because they taught him the truth of the scriptures. And so he becomes a Christ follower. Paul mentors him. Yet Timothy's got this problem because of the lack of that good, strong dad in his life. He's scared to death. He's a chicken. He is. He's a chicken for Christ. And how do I know that? Because Paul, over and over again, he always encourages the churches that Timothy's going to, Hey, take it easy on Timothy. He's a nervous wreck. Take it easy on Timothy. Timothy didn't have that strong backbone in him, and yet he's the one that's going to be the heir apparent to Paul's ministry. He's the one that's going to be the take over all the work I've done, and we're sitting back going, what? In fact, that's why we go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7, and Paul said this to Timothy as he opened remarks, and if you don't read this verse, you won't understand what the whole book's about that we've been talking about, and that's why it's about defining moments. Paul tells Timothy this. He said, for the Spirit of God gave us, the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid. Now, maybe your translation says differently. It might use the word fear. God did not give us a spirit of fear. Some of the translations say it that way. Same words. He's telling, why would he have to tell somebody who wasn't timid to not be timid, who who didn't have fear to not be fearful? Timothy had fear. In fact, he's so worried about Timothy's fear that he says, God's spirit didn't get, God's spirit did not make us, does not make us timid, but gives us power. In the Greek, that's the same word we, the root word we get for the word dynamite from, that kind of power. Word power and love and self-discipline. And that's what Paul had envisioned. That's what Paul's hoped for. And that's what he's writing everything else in this book about. Timothy, get a backbone. Because this is a defining moment in your life. And what we have to realize here 
is what keeps us, what kept Timothy from moving forward in his life, and what keeps us from moving forward in our life is a word called fear. Fear. You know, fear keeps you from moving forward. It really does. Fear comes, and, and what we know about fear is fear comes suddenly. I think about the disciples as they're in a boat with Jesus, and Jesus decides to take a power nap, and they're, hey, these are guys are veteran sailors. They're out used to, they're used to fishing the, the Sea of Galilee, and one of those crazy storms comes up, and they're, the next thing you know, they're going, Jesus, wake up! Don't you even care that we're going to die? It came suddenly, didn't it? What happened to these brave, strong guys? What happened to Peter, the guy who said, Jesus, I'll go with you to the jail. I'll even go with you all the way to the cross if I have to. And Jesus said, no, you won't. Why? Because Jesus knows what we're made of. And fear gets to us, and it comes suddenly, and that's the problem. The disciples found this out on the Sea of Galilee, that getting on board with Jesus, getting on board with Jesus can mean rough seas, and it will, because you will have trouble. It will mean heavy winds of life. And you will have them. So why are we complaining all the time? Why do we cry about it all the time? Because of fear. Fear, the fear factor, you know? Because what we know about fear, here's something you need to know about fear. Fear, fear corrodes our confidence in God's goodness. Do you know that? Fear corrodes our confidence in God's goodness. See, when things in your life don't go right, you know what you do? You emotionally get upset, and the first thing we do is we start looking for someone to blame. It happened in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? I was afraid and hid myself with the words of Adam to God. And what did he say? God says, why were you afraid? And Adam, I'm paraphrasing, by the way. And Adam says, it's because that woman you made me. You know what he's saying? He's saying, my confidence in you, God, is eroded. And don't we do that? Why don't I have the husband I'm supposed to have? Why don't I have the wife I'm supposed to have? Why don't I have anybody? Well, fear. It's eroded our confidence in God. So we put our confidence in ourselves or some dating app or something else. We put our, our confidence in our money. We put our confidence in our jobs. And when those things get a little shaky, we really get upset because fear. That's what fear does. It did the same thing for the disciples in the Sea of Galilee there. It, it unleashes a swarm of doubts in our lives. When we get afraid, we get fearful and we start doubting the goodness of God. And, and our doubts arise about who he is and his nature. That's what the disciples were doubting. Fear also turns us into control freaks. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the big... Hey, you know the, the, the most fearful people in life are the people that are control freaks. Have to control everything. Because that's the illusion. That's the illusion of it. Because at the, at the center of fear is a perceived loss of control. And so that's why we think we have to gain control. You know, when life spins out of control, when, when it goes wild, we start grabbing for a component of life that we can manage. And so we try and control everything about our lives. And the more, in, here's, the, here's the thing though, and this is what I know about insecure, fearful people who tend to be control freaks, they're mean. Because the more fearful they get, the meaner they get. And those people that control things all the time, they're just mean people. I'm a control freak, I am. I can be mean, I really can, ask my wife. She'll tell me how mean, she'll tell you how mean I am. I'm not lying there. Fear, though, it also does this. It creates a form of spiritual amnesia. That's what fear does to us. Do that to the disciples in the boat. They're sitting back. I'm, I'm thinking, hey, don't you guys remember when he fed the 5,000? Don't you remember when he healed people? He raised a little girl to life when he, when he changed a, a blind man's eyes so he could see? And, and, and you think a little wind and a little water is going to stop him? But they cried out and said, Jesus, don't you care? They forgot. Spiritual amnesia, isn't it? Haven't you been affected by spiritual amnesia in your life? Haven't you forgotten the goodness of God? See, fear dulls our miracle memory. That's what I would say, our miracle memory, right? It makes us forget what Jesus did for us the day we got saved. That he took and, and, and said, you know what, I don't remember your sins anymore. They're as far as the east is from the west. We forget all those things. And we forget how good God is. And when fear shapes our lives... Safety becomes our God, doesn't it? And that's all about America right now. Got to be safer. Got to have safety. Safety needs to rule my life. When safety becomes our God, what we do is we worship a risk-free life. And that's not the life God called us to, by the way. God called us to invest our lives. See, 
when we live a risk-free life and we embrace that, you know what? You can't love deeply without risk. And love, as Jesus would show us, is very risky. You ever thought about John 3.16? I mean, really thought about it. For God so loved the world. But was the world going to love him back? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But most of mankind is not going to love him back the way he deserves to be loved. They're going to reject him. In fact, they're going to get so angry that they will willfully take his son and crucify him. And that's what fear does to us. And so when we talk about this issue that, that Timothy's got, is an issue that you and I have. We like to play victim because fear makes victims of us all, doesn't it? But I told you at the beginning, we're not meant to be victims. We need to acknowledge the truth behind it that we're all sinners. And God died for us, and God loves you today. If you've never heard anything good, the best thing I can tell you today is that God loves you with an unconditional love, and there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God other than your choice. And that's the moment that makes the difference in our lives, the choice to let God love us or not. We're all given that choice. Timothy, Timothy in his life, he needed to be a courageous Christian, yet he was more of a coward like we are. You know how hard it is to talk to anybody about Jesus. That's the life we live, isn't it? Come on. Let's be honest today. And Paul here in our passage that we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he gives us three truths of choosing to be a courageous Christian that I want to leave you with today in our brief time. Number one, he gives us this truth. Courageous Christians gain steadfast strength and wisdom from the Lord. Isn't that great? See, I think the problem is Timothy probably was so scared, just like you and I are, when we're dealing with a world that we don't know how to combat. We don't have all the answers. We don't know enough. We're weak. We're frail. We know our limitations. And but you know what Paul says? Hey, hey, I'm not super Christian because of me. It's all about God. That's what he said. In fact, he starts off, and, and it's the first verse and the last verse of our passage there that, that I want to draw your attention to about this steadfast strength and wisdom that he gained. He says in verse number one, he says, you then, my son, be strong. I highlighted that word, that phrase before. Be strong. Don't be a weakling. But he doesn't say, be strong, go to the gym, work out a lot. Try and be Mr. Mr. Universe or whatever it is these days. He doesn't say that. He says, be strong in the one thing that you don't have to bring to the table. Isn't that great? You be strong as a Christ follower. You want to be a courageous Christian? You want to be like Paul? Be strong in something that you don't have, that you don't have to manufacture, that you don't have to really come up with, because God will give it to you. Isn't that great news? Be strong. Okay, you guys here today? Are you with me? This is exciting. Thing. If you're not excited about the grace of God, I don't know. We, we ought to pack up and go home. The grace of God is the most exciting thing in my life because I don't deserve anything but hell. That's what you deserve. You don't deserve the wife you've got, the husband you've got, the job you've got, the house you've got, the cat you have. Well, maybe the cat, but the dog you have, you don't deserve anything. If it was up to God's justice and only his justice, we would be burning in eternal flames for the rest of our existence. But we can be strong in the grace of God. Because God's riches at Christ's expense, that's grace, right? Grace is something that we didn't deserve but was given to us freely. He gives it plentifully. And you know what he's telling Timothy? There's a lot of things you could be strong as. I think sometimes we come to church and we try and put on this image of being strong. Be strong, show everybody how strong I am and what I know, and be strong in my, my big old... You know, there used to be a time when you carried the biggest Bible around, you know, big Bibles. That's not what he says be strong in. He says, don't put on a show. He says, be strong in grace. And just in case you didn't know where that grace was, it's not your grace. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. So that means connect with him. He goes on the last verse, just, just to emphasize it, he says, reflect. Reflect on what? Being strong in that grace. Reflect on what I've just told you. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord's going to give you what? Insight. Isn't that what we need? You don't have to, hey, you know what? When problems come to my, my mind, I, I, I'm a fixer. I want to fix things. I want to figure it out. I want to solve it. I, I don't have anything to fix anything with. 
Now, some of you guys are like, that's disappointing to have a pastor say that, but it's truth. You don't either. We try to, and when we try to fix things, you know what? It just makes it more of a mess. Paul tells Timothy, if I'm going to tell you the last thing of your life, Timothy, be strong in grace, number one, and number two, reflect on what I'm saying here because the Lord's going to give you insight into all this. God's grace to us gives us the spirit of God, gives us the power of God, gives us the mind of God when we're in Christ Jesus. And that's where we have the hope because we can gain a steadfast strength that's not ours. We can get a wisdom from God that's not ours. James told us that. James chapter 1, he said, you know what? Ask God for wisdom from above. The God who gives to all men. He doesn't qualify. He says all men liberally, generously, without conditions, because we knows we need it, because we're a bunch of dodos. We are. Hey, look at the person next to you and say, I'm a dodo. Some of you didn't do it. Come on. I'm a dodo, you're a dodo, we're all dodos, you know? It's almost like that Dr. Pepper commercial back years ago, right? We are all a bunch of dodos. And if you don't have Jesus in you, you have no hope of wisdom. And that's what Paul, and you know, some of you are like, I'm so proud, that, doesn't, that offends me. Okay, well, you can be offended right now, but I'm telling you, it's the truth. Because without God and his word, his spirit to guide us into all truth, that's what the Holy Spirit's for, we have no chance. We're all a bunch of dodos. We're sinners, saved by grace if, if we have acknowledged that relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's the great hope we have. And then he goes on to tell us that courageous Christians not only have that, but they teach absolute truth as found in the word of God. Wow, step number two. So, so Timothy, in your cowardly self, in your, your, your weak, no backbone life, how are you going to be able to fulfill the need to follow Paul, the successful guy who wrote half the Bible, started a lot of churches, and really pushed Christianity to the Western world, us? How are you going to do this? First of all, be strong in the strength of God, in his, his grace, in his truth, and then teach that truth. Teach the absolute truth. We talked about the, everything. I, I was trying to be as silent as I could today in Sunday school because everything we went through in Sunday school, I'm, I'm preaching this morning. God works that out all the time. Just a different form, different passage. But this is the truth. You see, the problem with us, not only do we decide that we're victims in this world, but we also decided that we have God's power of creation in that we think we can create truth. Okay? Let me give you another, another truth that is completely true. You may dis be disappointed in it or, or whatever, but here's the thing. You cannot create truth in yourself. Because you have no truth in yourself without God. Truth can only be discovered by you, and that truth is absolute truth that comes from God. And when we say absolute truth, here's what I mean. Truth that's true for all peoples in all times in all situations. That's, all, that's absolute truth. And you know what? When we say that God is love, that's absolutely true. There's never a time that God's not love. Even you say, well, when he's punishing people? Absolutely, he's punishing them in love. He's divinely punishing him in love. See, love doesn't take preferences. Love does what it's supposed to do. God is truth. God is love. God is just. God is holy. We can say all those things. And, and what we're supposed to do according to this is Paul goes on to tell us in verse number two, this is what he means. He says, teach the absolute truth as found in the word of God. And he says, this is it. And the things, what things? The theology, all the, the, the teachings I've had, the things you've heard me say. In the presence of many witnesses. Not, we're not talking about the private, small conversations. The things I've been preaching, the things I've been teaching, what are you supposed to do? Timothy, all you have to do is replicate it. He says, entrust it. Entrust it to who? To reliable people. People that are just like me, just like you, reliable enough to hear the truth. They don't have to have super strength. They don't have to have supernatural powers. They don't have to be smooth talkers. He doesn't say any of those things, does he? He says, you know what you need to have? You need to have the truth, and you don't have the truth apart from God. So have God, and what you hear from God's word, what you're entrusted with, then you're supposed to take those things to reliable people. He goes on to say, reliable people. Who are going to give that to other people, right? He says that you're going to trust other people. 
He says those other people are going to trust people who are qualified to teach others. And there's this pattern that is supposed to be repeated. We learn. I thank God for the people who taught me years ago. From the time I was, I was as young enough to, to learn, my parents, I, I thank God for my parents. Oh, my goodness. I had a great set of parents. I wasn't thankful enough for them when I was younger. I love my, my mom and my dad, and I, I appreciate my dad and the truth that he taught me. They weren't perfect by any means, but they taught me some good truth. I can think of pastors along the way who taught me good truth, and I am so grateful to them. That I, I, and I wish we could go back and I could treat them better. They taught me, and they discipled me. I remember Larry Quinlan. He was a missionary. For, it still is, but he was a missionary for a long time. He worked with me when I was just a ninth grade young boy. I got saved in that time period. But I remember Larry. I, and I grew up in a pastor's home, so I knew the game. I knew everything about it. But you know what Larry did? He didn't ignore me just because I was a pastor's kid. Larry came by the house, and he took me out. And you know what he did? He said, hey, we're going to go visit some other teenagers. Why don't you come along with me so I can show you what to do? He didn't know that one day I was going to be a pastor. But Larry invested in me. And that's the idea. You don't have to do anything major. What is discipleship? Teaching what God has taught you to other people. Pouring your life into the life of somebody else. We should be discipling, because isn't that the Great Commission? We, the Great Commission is pouring ourselves into other people, pouring the heart of Christ into somebody else, because Jesus gave us grace. We could take that grace and teach others, and trust it to somebody else who is going to teach somebody else. And that's what I love, when you see someone who's so faithful to follow and do what they're supposed to do, not just sit on their hands and do nothing. That's where it comes to action. It's time to stop talking and start doing, isn't it? That's what, that's what Walt Disney was trying to get us to understand here. Teach others. And you can only teach what you know. That's the truth. Hey, you know what? I told these guys we had that shooting thing back in, at Ben's back in October. <laughs> I said, that's great. Somebody's going to have to know how to shoot, though, because I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy. I wish I was the guy, but... You know, I, I had a dad that, that was busy, and he never taught me to do those things. I don't hunt. I don't do any of those things. So you, some of you guys are looking at me like, what? My dad taught me other things, right? He did. He just didn't take the time to teach me some of those things. And I'm not mad about it, but I, it's not what I can teach. I can't teach somebody about guns, but I know some other people that can around here. I know a lot of guys in this church who can do that kind of stuff. That's just the truth. And what we know, we ought to be able to teach. You have a responsibility. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. You don't have to know more than you know. Study the word of God. In fact, that, you remember, that's what Timothy is going to be told. Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what he's saying? Learn this so you can teach this. And I have people I run into all the time going like, I couldn't teach a Sunday school class because... I just don't, and you know what I want to say? If you picked up your Bible every once in a while, you probably could teach. The reason you probably can't teach a Sunday school class is you don't read God's word. And that's harsh, but that's true. That's what you need to do. Be a student of God's word. Study. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show God, uh, to, 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 to understand God's word. Spend some time with God. That's how you become a courageous Christian. You got to put the time in. You got to put the work in. It's not a natural gift. It's not something you just walk up and go, hey, I understand everything about the Word of God. Let me just do this thing. That's not it. It's not a gimmick. Study. And then the third thing he says, the third truth about being a courageous Christian is live life to make a kingdom impact. And that's so important here. He goes on in verse number three. He says, join me with me in suffering. Now, if you don't know the whole story of Paul, Paul was a murderer. And that should all make us go, oh, what? Paul was a murderer. He would tell you that. If he was standing right here, he'd be very old, but he would tell you that. Paul was a murderer. Who did he murder? <laughs> Christians. That was what his job was. And he was good at it. Paul, though, was sincere, thinking that he wanted to serve 
God, but he just didn't know who God was. And he rejected Jesus Christ because of his own preconceived thoughts. But on the road to Damascus, as he's going to find other people to put in prison and possibly execute, God appears to him, Jesus Christ, and blinds him, knocks him off his saddle. And there he's blinded, and he's taken to Damascus, and he's led down to a, a, a room, and there he sits for days, fasting and, and, and really seeking God. He's blind, and God reaches out to a man, and he says, hey, I want you to go down to the street called Straight in Damascus, and I want you to find this guy named, his name at that time was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He said, I want you to go tell him about the things he's going to have to suffer for me. <laughs> I mean, is that, that the introduction that you want for Christianity, man? Hey, Paul, Saul, whoever you are, I want you to know Jesus loves you, and he wants you to suffer. See, we, we tend to play the victim card so much that we think we shouldn't suffer, you know? But I signed on to Christianity, and I'm supposed to have a great mar- an easy, great marriage, a bunch of kids that are just wonderful and easy to work with. I, I should be go, we should be just sitting around singing kumbaya all the time, right? Right? You guys know what kumbaya, kumbaya is? Okay. And <laughs> Paul says, no. Timothy, my last words to you are the first words I heard as a Christian. That you're called to suffer. You're called to suffer. So why do we complain so much? You're called to suffer. And you know what? When you get the chance to suffer for Jesus Christ, you're supposed to rejoice in those sufferings. Praise God that we have suffering opportunities. Yet most of us would sit back and go, wait a minute, I don't like the suffering stuff. I wanted the easy road. I wanted, you know... Baskets full of puppies, and I wanted uh, uh, all kinds, maybe not baskets full of puppies, but I wanted all kinds of easy stuff in my life. Hey, you know you young people that are getting married? I want you to know, marriage is hard. <laughs> Can I get an amen there? Amen. Marriage is not easy. It's not always fun. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. But it's not easy. Nothing in life that's worth anything is easy. Okay. I'm just telling you, that's that's an easy one there, too. And Paul says, Timothy, you want to be a courageous Christian? You want to be the the person you're supposed to be? Join with me in suffering. You're talking to a guy who's scared to death. Paul says, hey, join the crowd. You know why Paul's saying that? He's in prison. (laughs) He's saying, Timothy, I saved you a seat right here next to me. You know, we're on death row. Come on, join me. It's great. And we look at Guys like Paul and go, are you nuts? Are you crazy? But that's what we've been called to, to advance the kingdom of God. And then he gives us three important pictures here that, that help us understand this. He says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul, when he talks about soldiers, he's not talking about modern day soldiers. The modern day soldiers have a lot more, and they, they suffer a lot. I don't want to put those down. Pray for your military. They're doing good work. But I want you to know, Paul's vision is that of the Roman guard. And those guys were hardcore. There was nothing easy about their lives. Everything was tough. And he says, hey, you know what? Join with me in this suffering. How do I do this? Join with me in this suffering. Because what he's trying to paint in these three pictures is, number one, the soldier. This good soldier, what does he do? Well, he keeps going in this next verse. He says, hey, no one's serving. No one's serving. That's the key word. I would circle that word, underline that word in your Bible. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. And I want you to understand what he's saying there. He's saying, you know what? As a soldier, Timothy, as a soldier, Maple Springs, you're called to live a life of rugged expectation. Rugged expectation. You know why? Because this, the, what, he, what he goes on to say there that keeps going in verse 4, he says, he rather he tries to please his commanding officer. You know what he's saying there? A soldier, his duty is a life of rugged expectation. And as soldiers of Christ, your obligation, your life is about the glory of God. That's what life's all about. Amen. Your purpose in life, no matter what you do, what occupation you hold or anything else, is the glory of God. Do you realize that? 
And every moment, these decisions you make are about glorifying God or not glorifying God. That's the easiest way I can break them down. The destination of your life. I, I talked to a guy this week, and I said, hey, you know what? How, where are you headed in life? Where are you headed in life? And he said, what do you mean? He talked about church. He talked about family. He talked about all these things. I said, hey, you know, the one person you haven't talked about is God Almighty. When life's over, what are you going to say? Hey, I had a great family. Hey, I had a great house. Hey, I had a great job. Hey, I had a great wife, great kids. Those are nice things. Don't get me wrong. But that's not going to be the end of your life that's worth telling. If, all that's ha- if that's all you have at the end of your life, you have nothing. You will have wasted your life. Paul says, you know what? You're here to have a rugged life, a life that is called to glorify God. And as a soldier, it's a rugged expectation. Number two, he goes on and he says similarly, verse five, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive, he goes on, the victor's crown except by competing to the, uh, uh, to, according to the rules. And that's our second example. He gives us a soldier, now he gives us an athlete. And when he's talking athlete, think of the ancient Olympics. But I think of the modern Olympics, because I wasn't in ancient Greece. And, and I've read so many stories about these young, young kids. That's all I could say. They're kids when they start out. That they start out, and, and while their friends are out eating pizza and riding bikes and playing, uh, and, and even on the internet and playing video games and doing whatever they want to do, riding dirt bikes and, and shooting guns and stuff like that, you know what they're doing? They're competing. They're working hard. They're competing every day. They're training. You see, you don't get to be an Olympic athlete by eating pizza every day. You don't just jump. Hey, Michael Phelps, when he, he won all those swimming records, you know what? He didn't just jump in the pool one day and goes, look what I could do. That guy got up at, you know, he was in the pool at 4 a.m. every day. Every day. 4 a.m.? That's ridiculous. And you know why he did that? Because he wanted to win. I mean, does anybody play games just to play? Are you, is anybody in here like that? Okay. You need to see Sandra and myself, because we don't do that. We play a game, we want to win, right, Sandra? We want to win. We don't want to come. Hey, you know what? Second place, this is what I was taught, second place is first loser. Oh, I know that's shocking. I know. Hey, no one plays a game to lose, especially the game of life. And that's what Paul's saying here. Hey, you know what? You are a, an athlete, and here it is. He says, you know what? As an athlete, you're called to live a life of rigid separation. Because what an athlete does is say, hey, you know what? There are things I can't do in life. I can't keep doing these things. I can't eat what I want. I can't stay up all night. I can't play with my friends. I can't watch TV. I can't do mindless things. I can't go off and do what I want to do. It's rigid expectation Because if I want to do this, there's a purpose, because what I'm trying to do is win. And you know what? As the athlete, we're called to live for Christ in holiness. That's the rigid separation, isn't it? And you say, well, what do you mean holiness? And you know what God says? God's word says, be holy, because I am holy. And that word holiness means set apart, sanctified, put apart for a separate purpose, and, and you know what? I, I love the fact that in the, both Peter and Paul say the same thing. He said, you know what? You're supposed to be presented to Christ like a bride. We're going to have these weddings, so we might throw this analogy in. Like a bride who wears white because she's never had any kind of intimate relationships with anybody. Spotless, without blemish. That's what he uses. And I know that's a hard picture, but you know what? That's how God, that's what God expects out of you and me. You say, well, <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah, if you're not in the grace of God, you can't do that. That's where, go back to verse 1. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus, because that's the only way. It's the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ that allows us to do that. But the expectation is for you to be lives, that lives a life of rugged expectation for the glory of God, and then be an athlete who lives a life of rigid expectation, separation, who lives in Christ's holiness and then he goes on, and he keeps going. He says, the third example, the hardworking farmer. And everybody's like, yeah, I get this one. The hardworking farmer. Not these modern farmers. And I'm not saying Seth doesn't work hard, because he works hard. But think about first century. 
There's nobody delivering feed to you. There's nobody giving you all these tractors. You don't have John Deere or Kubota or any of these other things. The hard-working farmer. These guys are working not to make money. They're working just to stay alive. He says the hard-working farmer should be the first, the primary, the first to receive a share of his crops. And, and that, out of all of them, you're sitting there going, what? And what he's trying to say here is, and he wants us to see this, he says, you know what, Timothy? The farmer is supposed to live a life of ready anticipation. Ready anticipation. <laughs> What's he anticipating? The harvest. He's anticipating the day, the day he's got to sell out his chickens, right? He's anticipating the things that he needs to do. He's anticipating this, and it's hard work. Hey, it's not sit back. It's not rest, relax. Those are the hardest days. We're going to stay up and get the harvest in before it's too late. It's, it's, and you know what he's saying here? The farmer, in anticipating this, this, having this life of ready anticipation, the farmer's job is to live for God's purpose. For God's purpose. And what is God's purpose? The kingdom. To build the kingdom. You want to be courageous? Live like a soldier. You're going to have some tough, tough, tough lives, but it's not for you. It's for God's glory. The reason we play the victim is we think it's for us. It's for God's glory. <laughs> you know who you're supposed to be? You're supposed to be an athlete. And you've got to give up a bunch of stuff because God's called you to live a holy life. And that means, hey, you know what? You don't get all the things you want. We're supposed to be living a life of holiness for Christ, in Christ's holiness. And then the farmer. The farmer, man, get about the work. Be a hardworking farmer and live the life of anticipating the harvest. And that's ready to live that life that does the kingdom work. Here's your takeaway. God provides strength. Strength for what? Strength for the storm. The storm that's coming. And courage to conquer the chaos. That's what Paul was saying to us. You're going to have problems in this world. Today's the day of decision. That's the question. The question I have, if you've heard all this, you know the truth, and it's not something I made up. This right from God's word. Here's the truth. What are you going to do about it? See, here's what frustrates your preacher. Is week after week, people come in. Amen, preacher. Amen, that was really good. And you walk out the doors, and nothing's changed. Because talk is cheap. It's time for some action. Walt Disney. I'm more of a Nike guy, and here's what I say. Just do it. Just do it. Hey, you know what? The Christian life is a life of doing by serving God. Kingdom priorities. If we're going to reach somebody, it's not because you sat here and listened to me. It's because you walked out these doors changed as a soldier, as an athlete, as a hardworking farmer. But we can sit back and say, you know, no, no, it's about me. It's about my job, it's about my family, it's about my business. Or you can say, I surrender all, God. Change my heart. These are the invitation songs we sing, isn't it? I, I, I have decided to follow Jesus. Aren't these the songs we sing? They're just words, though, if you're not doing it, when are you going to do it? 